Do you know anyone who is directionally challenged? Someone who gets lost anytime he or she goes anywhere? Someone who doesn't seem to know right from left or north from south? Someone who starts out for the Poconos and ends up halfway to Harrisburg before realizing that she missed the exit to 476 North? Someone who is always late when you're planning to meet somewhere because he took a wrong turn. Those without a natural sense of direction must work hard at developing the skills and senses to find their way in the world. Fortunately, technological advances are making navigation easier for the directionally challenged. Sonar readouts have replaced sextants among those who sail the high seas. Precise commuter, precise computer imaging has rendered the compass obsolete in the cockpits of airplanes. Instead of depending on the stars for direction, soldiers now use infrared night goggles to find their way. And GPS systems are now standard feature on smartphones to help regular people like you and me find our way to unfamiliar places with ease and efficiency. Such advances give us an ever more detailed picture of the world and our place in the world at any given moment. And as we're traveling, they provide us with clear direction and let us know which way we should go. Thus far, we've considered the challenges of making our way across the landscapes of our world, but we also need help. We also need guidance when it comes to taking the spiritual journeys of our lives. Fortunately, such help is available. Divine guidance is given to us in the Judeo-Christian scriptures, which tell the stories of our ancestors in the faith and how they were guided on their faith journeys, how they received strength to handle adversity, and how they were equipped to face temptation. Today's scripture passage, our gospel lesson, demonstrates how Jesus himself was equipped to face temptation. First, we read that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. And we know that the Spirit sustained him during his trials, strengthened him as he faced temptation. Second, he was also strengthened and guided by the scriptures as he defended himself against the assaults of the devil, which he encountered in these wilderness tests. Jesus remained wholly obedient to the words of faith and trust which were first revealed to the Israelites as they struggled to find direction in the wilderness, as they struggled to make their way from Egypt to the Promised Land. Notice, three times Jesus quotes the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy as he counters the devil's propositions. Although the devil tries to lure him into taking advantage of his extraordinary powers, Jesus steadfastly refuses to usurp his heavenly father's authority for his own benefit. Sometimes in life, we have a strong sense that something isn't right. Whatever stands before us is not something we should do, and we know it. We don't need flashing lights to tell us to stop, to tell us don't go there. But sometimes life can be ambiguous. Our intuition fails us, or the pathway into dangerous territory appears to be harmless, or attractive, or even reasonable. So much so that we fail to anticipate what could go wrong if indeed we do go there. It couldn't hurt to fake an illness and call off sick just this once. It couldn't hurt to fudge the numbers just this once. It couldn't hurt to accept this sleazy 
but rich new client just this once. It couldn't hurt not to tell my spouse where I've really been just this once. It couldn't hurt to take out my frustration on the kids just this once. It couldn't hurt to focus only on the bottom line just this once. It couldn't hurt to act now and pray later just this once. It couldn't hurt to leave God's law and Christ's love out of my decision-making process just this once. But making the wrong decision in such situations can be harmful to ourselves, to others, and to our relationship with God. The wrong choice could hurt, and often it does hurt. As we have such thoughts, we would do well to keep in mind that although these decisions may seem to be minor or inconsequential, for Jesus, there is no such thing as being kind of obedient to God. We are either obedient or disobedient. We are either for God or against God. And in our gut, we know this to be true. How important it is that, like Jesus, we trust the Word of God and the leading of the Spirit to reliably guide us in all situations, which may sound like a simplistic formula or some magic formula for decision-making. However, the truth is, if we know the Scriptures, we will often have a clear sense of how to make right decisions we will often have a clear sense of which way to go. And for those situations which do not appear to be so clear-cut, a humble prayer asking for the Spirit's guidance will often result in a gentle nudge or some other signal pointing the way for us. By the way, in spite of the ways in which the world has changed during the 2,000 years since Jesus faced these temptations in the, in the desert, the temptations we face are still somewhat similar to the three tests confronted by Jesus. For instance, when we use our special gifts or special status to obtain benefits solely for ourselves without considering the impact these actions will have on others or on God's plan for the world, it's a little bit like turning stones into bread. For example, does our special status as citizens of a developed country justify our insatiable appetite for consuming more and more goods, using more and more of the rest of the world's resources in ways that limit the possibilities for growth and health in numerous developing countries. Perhaps as a society, we are guilty of yielding to the temptation to turn the earth into our own loaf of bread. Perhaps also we are tempted to worship and serve a power other than God. That is giving final authority or ultimate control to a force or individual, or group, or ideal, other than God and God's word to us. The devils which attempt to usurp God's authority in the world today do not appear in red suits with pointed tails and holding a pitchfork. Instead, at times, we worship and give our primary allegiance to such gods as social status, the craving for new and ever more thrilling experiences, consumerism, and believing that more is always better, needing to feel in control, in charge, or on top of the ladder of success. Or perhaps for us, it's simply one of the big three, sex, money, or power. The question becomes, 
Are we guilty of having been successfully tempted into worshiping one or more of these idols or demanding devils, leaving devotion and service to God somewhere by the side of the road? And if the answer is yes, we must decide what it is we're willing to do about that. Then there is putting God to the test. That is putting requirements or conditions on our faithfulness. God, if you do this, I'll do that. Does my faith consist of real faith? the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen? Or is it only as strong as the most recent demonstration of God's power in my life? Or more specifically, the most recent demonstration of God's power for my benefit in my life? Faith is faith, precisely because it does not demand that God perform on cue, because it believes in God's promises because it accepts God's presence as a given, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the challenges. This can be hard stuff. This, for many, can be the most difficult of wilderness experiences. It's not a wilderness we enter into of our own will or because we like a good challenge. This is the kind of wilderness that is sometimes thrust upon us by the circumstances of life. A lost job, a spouse leaves and we didn't see it coming, we get cancer, or worse yet, a son or a daughter, a spouse or a parent gets cancer. A son or a daughter makes a choice that causes pain or heartache. We are betrayed by a dear friend a loved one dies. God seems to be absent. Spiritually speaking, these kinds of experiences can be a real test. We ask God for a miracle, and the miracle doesn't happen. In such circumstances, we may be tempted to blame God, or we may be tempted to give up on God. We may be tempted to lose our faith, and we may yield to such temptations. Such are the worst kinds of wilderness experiences. We get hurt, we feel lost, we experience loneliness, we feel spiritually dry. All we wanted was a miracle. Is that too much to ask from the God who can command his angels to protect us. William Sloan Coffin was, for a number of years, the pastor of Riverside Church in New York City. And his son, in his early 20s, died in a car accident one week. And the following Sunday, William Sloan Coffin mounted that pulpit which I think in and of itself took a lot of strength. He mounted that pulpit, and during his sermon, as he talked about losing his son, he said that God offers minimum protection, but maximum support. I think there's great truth in that. God offers minimum protection, but maximum support. The wilderness experience for Jesus lasted for 40 days. For the Israelites, making their way from Egypt to the Promised Land, it lasted for 40 years. In either case, it seemed like indeed it was a long time. Likewise, our times in the wilderness can seem like an eternity. And we cry out to God to make it end. But until it does end, we can be encouraged by the example of Jesus. We can be encouraged to rely on the Holy Spirit, who is also known as the Comforter. We can be encouraged to rely on the scriptures, which can teach us how others have handled their wilderness experiences. And we can remember 
the wilderness experience, the time of testing, the times of suffering have often used by God, have often been used by God to strengthen those whom God loves, referring specifically to suffering. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in his letter to the Romans, suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Remembering that God loves us, may we, like Paul, trust God to use our suffering to bring about something good. May we trust God to use our wilderness experiences to produce in us endurance, character, and hope. May it be so. Amen.